Hi everyone, this is Teresa Bennett, the Analyst Coach, and our webinar today is on audience recognition and conflict resolution. You're never going to speak or write in a vacuum. When you create a document, lead a requirement session, give a presentation, communicate with subject matter experts, you need to consider these questions. Who is your audience? What do they know? Expect there to be different levels of knowledge in the audience. What do they not know? What do you need to say or write for your audience to understand your point? How do you communicate to a multi-level audience? What is each person's position in relation to your job title? Are you speaking to peers? Are you speaking to your manager, the executive team, etc.? What is the audience's attitude toward the topic? Is it something they're excited about? Is it something maybe they're not so excited about? Um, do you have SMEs that aren't interested in the project at all? Do you have SMEs that already understand the vision and they're dying to jump in and get started? So that's two different ends of the spectrum and you might have some people in the middle too, right? What diversity issues do you need to consider? Cultural, gender, things like that. Location, are they in person or are they on the phone? Originally, I said that there were seven questions that you needed to ask before you got into your meeting. I think this ended up, yeah, this ended up being 11 questions. So uh, a little more than the seven that I originally thought I was going to have when I started going through it. But, um, but these are things that you want to consider before you start your meetings. Make sure your message does not include jargon or acronyms that some of the audience may not understand. You have to remember that you're speaking to the whole room and not just to a specific person. To communicate successfully, you have to be able to recognize your audience's level of understanding, which if you go through those questions that we just looked at, then um, that's going to help you at least with the people that you've had previous interaction with that's in your meeting, you'll at least know what level they're at. You also need to consider your audience's unique personality and traits, which could impact how successful your communications are. Things to ascertain from your project team are Things like, what does your audience know of the subject matter? In a requirement session, do you have SMEs that know different areas of business instead of one SME that knows the entire business process from end to end? So you could have, you know, multiple SMEs in the room because you've got different levels of expertise in different areas rather than, you know, that one SME that just kind of knows it all, right? Does the audience work closely with the subject at hand? Um, are they an expert truly on the subject, right? They're not just called a SME, they actually are a subject matter expert. Does the audience have general knowledge of the subject matter, but a different area of expertise? Is the audience totally uninvolved with the subject matter? You probably have a mix of all three of those types when you're in a requirement session. SMEs will understand the jargon related to the business subject being discussed, probably better than you understand it. The SMEs are going to be able to explain the details for standard procedures, business processes, etc. The part of your audience that is not a SME is probably somewhat familiar with the subject, but their job responsibilities are peripheral to the subject matter. They might work in IT or another department or maybe even work outside of your company. They might be like a vendor. Because this part of your audience is familiar with the subject matter, they understand some of the jargon, but definitely not all of it. So you still need to avoid acronyms and other jargon as much as possible. You may also need to provide more background information um, to this part of your audience so they have a better understanding of the subject matter. You might also have audience members that have no knowledge of the subject matter. There could be a developer in a meeting that hasn't worked on this application before. You could have a project manager assigned to this project that's new to the company, for example. Uh, I know that 
you know, anytime, of course, that I've started out at a new company on my first project, well, I don't know their business because I'm new to their business, right? So you have to take things like that into consideration as well. These audience members will be unfamiliar with the subject matter and completely lost if you jump in and get started on requirements. Remember to give some background and just as important, remember to speak in clear, simple terms. You need to explain the topic clearly through precise word usage, depth of detail, and maybe even use some simple graphics. For existing applications, a PowerPoint presentation with some screenshots of the app and an overview of how it works is really a great place to start and get everybody grounded. By considering personality traits, you can speak using the appropriate tone, visual aids, and writing style for your documentation. By recognizing the audience's personality traits, you can more effectively get the desired response from the audience. You know, obviously you can't always know the personality traits of everyone in your audience. However, most of the time you're going to be speaking to at least some of the people that you know, unless of course you're new to the company. You're most likely going to have some people in your requirement sessions or meetings that you've worked with previously. To foster effective communication, you want to factor in your knowledge of their personalities, their attitudes, and their preferences. Do you know any of these things about some of your audience? Are they slow to act? Are they eager, questioning, organized? Maybe they're disorganized. Oppositional, which is uh, kind of a nice way of just saying argumentative. Are they negative or are they positive? Are they non-committal? Do they prefer you to be short and to the point? What are you expecting from your audience? Are you expecting them to provide business requirements? Do you want them to consider an idea and make suggestions? Do you want them to reject some options? In other words, do you want them to make a choice between you know, two or more suggestions? Are you just expecting them to listen or, um, or maybe read and file the information for future use? To get what you want from your audience, taking personality traits into consideration will help you get it. Your audience is never composed of people just like you, so you need to remember that. To be clear, diversity includes gender, race, ethnicity, religion, age, sexual orientation, class, physical and mental characteristics, language, family issues, and department diversity. Your coworkers will have many different interests, levels of knowledge, backgrounds, and life experiences. A diverse workforce keeps companies competitive. Talent does not come in one color, nationality, or belief system. Talent is represented, represented by people from a vast array of backgrounds and life experiences. Your audience is diverse and you need to keep that in mind in your communication style when we're talking about both oral and written communications. Things to keep in mind when you're working on a project with a multicultural team that spans different countries. Verbal and nonverbal communication norms for those countries and cultures, management styles, decision-making procedures, sense of time and place, local values, beliefs, and attitudes. Due to the multicultural makeup of your audience, you have to ensure that your writing, speaking, and nonverbal communication skills are going to accommodate those language barriers and cultural customs. In many cases, conflict in the workplace just seems to be a fact of life. We've all seen situations where different people with different goals and needs have come into conflict. And we've all seen the often intense personal animosity that can result. The fact that conflict exists, however, is not necessarily a bad thing. As long as it's resolved effectively, it can lead to personal and professional growth. In many cases, effective conflict resolution can make the difference between positive and negative outcomes. The good news is that by resolving conflict successfully, you can solve many of the problems that it has brought to the surface, as well as getting benefits that you might not at first expect. Some of those benefits are things like increased understanding. 
The discussion needed to resolve conflict expands people's awareness of the situation, giving them an insight into how they can achieve their goals without undermining those of other people. Another unexpected benefit could be increased group cohesion. When conflict is resolved effectively, team members can develop stronger mutual respect and a renewed faith in their ability to work together. Another one is improved self-knowledge. Conflict pushes individuals to examine their goals in close detail, helping them understand the things that are most important to them, sharpening their focus and enhancing their effectiveness. If conflict is not handled effectively, the results can be damaging. Conflicting goals can quickly turn into personal dislike. Teamwork breaks down, talent is wasted, and people disengage from their work. It's easy to end up in a vicious downward spiral of negative incrimination or recrimination, sorry. In order for the team to really work effectively, you need to stop that downward, sp downward spiral as soon as you can. To do this, it helps to understand conflict styles and some of the theories that lie behind, lie behind that you know, effective conflict resolution. And this is something you might be thinking to yourself, oh, this isn't something that I would have to deal with. The project manager would have to deal with this. But if you have conflict coming up in your requirement sessions, you could have a session where your project manager isn't even in the session. So you can't assume that somebody else is going to handle that conflict for you when it comes up. You've got to be able to do that um, as part of, you know, your communication skills. It's one of the things that uh, organizations look for BAs to be able to do is um, effectively resolve conflict. There are five main styles of dealing with conflict, and those are competitive, collaborative, compromising, accommodating, and avoiding. So now let's take a little deeper dive and look at each of those five. Competitive. People who tend towards a competitive style take a firm stand and know what they want. They usually operate from a position of power drawn from things like position, rank, expertise, or a persuasive ability. You may not be you know, higher up in the food chain, so to speak. But if you have persuasive ability, then then this could be a style that you could use. This style can be useful when there's an emergency and a decision needs to be made fast. When the decision is unpopular or when defending against someone who is trying to exploit the situation selfishly. However, it can leave people feeling bruised, unsatisfied, and resentful when it's used in less urgent situations. So make sure that you're keeping that in mind and only using that style of dealing with conflict when it's absolutely necessary. Collaborative. People tending towards a collaborative style try to meet the needs of all people involved. These people can be highly assertive, but unlike the competitor, they cooperate effectively and acknowledge that everyone is important. This style is useful when you need to bring together a variety of viewpoints to get the best solution. When there have been previous conflicts in the group or when the situation is too important for a simple trade-off. Compromising. People who prefer a compromising style try to find a solution that will at least partially satisfy everyone. Everyone is expected to give up something and the compromiser, him or herself, also expects to relinquish something. Compromise is useful when the cost of conflict is higher than the cost of losing ground, when equal strength opponents are at a standstill, and when there's a deadline looming. Accommodating. This style indicates a willingness to meet the needs of others at the expense of the person's own needs. The accommodator often knows when to give in to others, but can be persuaded to surrender a position even when it is not warranted. This person is not assertive, but is highly cooperative. Accommodation is appropriate when the issues matter more to the other party, when peace is more valuable than winning, or when you want to be in a position to collect on the favor you gave. However, people may not return favors, and overall this approach is unlikely to really give the best outcome. Avoiding. 
People tending towards this style seek to evade the conflict entirely. This style is typified by delegating controversial decisions, accepting default decisions, and not wanting to hurt anyone's feelings. It can be appropriate when victory is impossible, when the controversy is trivial, or when someone else is in a better position to solve the problem. However, in many situations, this is a weak and ineffective approach to take. And quite frankly, a lot of times people will use the excuse of, uh, oh, uh, I just wanted to, um, I just felt like it wasn't worth it that, you know, going with the victory was impossible. So I just decided to do this. Sometimes it's not really that you're deciding to do that. It's actually that you're, you're avoiding something. So you really need to look at yourself and be able to um, honestly see if you are somebody that typically avoids conflict, runs from it like the plague, and will make excuses to try to avoid dealing with that conflict. And if that's the case, then you want to do some work to move past that and be able to actually resolve conflict rather than avoiding it. So um, something to look at about yourself if you find that you usually avoid conflict. And I just want to point out that for all five of these styles, you are never going to just pick a style and say, oh, this is me and this is what I'm going to do in every conflict type, right? Because as you can see from what I was explaining there, there's certain situations where a specific contact or conflict type is um, a good one to use and then other situations where that one would not work well. So it's not that you pick a conflict resolution style and say, this is what I'm going to do every time. It's that you really know what the differences are between them and you know when it's useful to use one so that when it comes time, you can kind of go through your memory bank and say, okay, for this situation, here's how I'm going to approach it. I'm going to be collaborative or I'm going to be avoiding or I'm going to be competitive, whatever it is, right? So it's really about the particular um, situation. So don't just, um, you know, go with, hey, I'm going to pick a style and that's what I'm going to do. Once you understand the different styles, you can use them to think about the most appropriate approach or a mixture of approaches for the situation you're in. Like I was just talking about, you might even have a particular situation, a conflict that you might even use two different styles during that conflict resolution of that one conflict. So think about your own instinctive approach, like I said, and see which conflict style you naturally gravitate to, and then realize and keep in mind that you need to use the other styles as well. Even though you have one that feels natural to you, you're going to need to be able to incorporate the other ones as well, depending on the type of situation that you're in. Now let's look at the theory called interest-based relational approach. This type of conflict re resolution respects individual differences while helping people avoid becoming too entrenched in a fixed position. When you're using this approach to resolve conflict, you need to follow these rules. Make sure that good relationships are the first priority. As far as possible, make sure that you treat the other calmly and that you try to build mutual respect. Do your best to be courteous to one another and remain constructive under pressure. Keep people and problems separate. Recognize in many cases that, uh, that the other person is not just being difficult. Real and valid differences can lie behind conflict of positions. By separating the problem from the person, real issues can be debated without damaging working relationships. Pay attention to the interests that are being presented. By listening carefully, you will most likely understand why the person is adopting his or her position. Listen first, talk second. You guys have heard me say this before. To solve a problem effectively, you have to understand where the other person is coming from before defending your own position. Set out the facts. Agree and establish the objective, observable elements that will have an impact on the decision. 
explore options together. Be open to the idea that a third position may exist and that you can get to this idea jointly. So it's not always a you're right or the other person is right. It could be some completely different idea if you have your mind open to that. By following these rules, you can often keep contentious discussions positive and constructive. This helps to prevent the antagonism and dislike, which so often causes conflict to spin out of control, which is exactly what we don't want to have happen. You should try to follow a conflict resolution process. So let's take a look at what that would look like. A starting point for dealing with conflict is to identify the overriding conflict style employed by yourself, your team, or your organization. Over time, people's conflict management styles tend to mesh, and a right way will, will um, you know, will come out to solve conflict. Um, it's really going to, you know, something is going to emerge as your, you know, your group's right way of dealing with conflict. It's good to recognize when the style can be used effectively. However, you want to make sure that people understand that different styles may suit different situations, just like we just talked about. Look at the circumstances and think about the style that may be appropriate. If you're involved in the conflict, emphasize the fact that you're presenting your perception of the problem. Use active listening skills to ensure you hear and understand others' positions and perceptions. So restate what they're saying, paraphrase what they're saying, summarize what they're saying. Use those active listening skills. Make sure that when you talk, you're using an adult, assertive approach rather than a submissive or aggressive style. Either of those two things, submissive or aggressive, is not good. Adult, assertive approach is what you want to use. Try to understand the other person's motivations and goals and see how your actions may be affecting those. Try to understand the conflict in objective terms. Is it affecting work performance, damaging the delivery to the client, disrupting teamwork, hampering decision-making? Be sure to focus on work issues and leave personalities out of the discussion. Listen with empathy and see the conflict from the other person's point of view. Identify issues clearly and uh, concisely. Use I statements. Don't use you statements. When you use you, you're going to put people on the defensive. And then remember to remain flexible. Often different underlying needs, interests, and goals can cause people to perceive problems very differently. You will need to agree on the problem that you're trying to solve before you'll find a mutually acceptable solution. Sometimes different people will see different but interlocking problems. If you can't reach a common perception of the problem, then at the very least you need to understand what the other person sees as the problem. If everyone is going to feel satisfied with the resolution, it will help if everyone has fair input in generating solutions. Brainstorm possible solutions and be open to all ideas, including ones you never considered before. By this stage, the conflict may be resolved. Both sides may better understand the position of the other and a mutually satisfactory solution may be clear to all. However, you may also have uncovered real differences between your positions. This is where a technique like win-win negotiation which means finding a fair compromise, can be useful to find a solution that, at least to some extent, satisfies everyone. And there are three guiding principles here. Be calm, be patient, have respect. Remember that conflict in the workplace can be incredibly destructive to good teamwork. Managed in the wrong way, real and legitimate differences between people can quickly spiral out of control resulting in situations where cooperation breaks down and the team's mission is threatened. This is particularly the case where the wrong approaches to conflict resolution are used. So again, I wanna stress, make sure that you don't always use the same approach every time. To calm these situations down, it helps to take a positive approach to conflict resolution. 
where discussion is courteous and non-confrontational, and the focus is on issues rather than on individuals. If this is done, then as long as people listen carefully and explore facts, issues, and possible solutions properly, conflict can often be resolved effectively. Let's talk for a second about um, handling negative stakeholders. If you're shy or uh, take longer to bond with people, it does not mean that you can't be a good BA. It just means you need to recognize these things about yourself and ask the stakeholder questions, right? Ask questions, right? And keep asking questions, 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 questions until the source of their negativity surfaces. But you want to make sure that you're going to ask with genuine interest and that you don't come across as defensive. That will make them shut down and stop contributing to the discussion at all. There is a purpose and reason for their negativity, and it will provide you with information about the project or certain aspects of the project that you will not get from anyone else. Remember that those who are in favor of the project often will not tell you the real risks. You want to listen to what the negative person has to say. Oftentimes, they just want to know that their concerns are being heard. To succeed in turning negative stakeholders around, I want you to try using some of these tips. Try turning the negative into a positive. Many projects deal with transformations and process improvements on many levels, and people that are uncomfortable with change or are worried about their jobs becoming obsolete are oftentimes going to look at the changes in a negative light. It's your job to show them the positive in the situation. Sometimes you may even see a person's frame of mind change as a new solution is defined. You've got to be a people person. Aside from the skills you need as a BA to complete your tasks, you also need interpersonal skills to enable you to bond with people in minimal time. Use empathy and offer assistance after tapping into their fear. Be able to step outside of your comfort zone when you're in requirement sessions, right? A lot of that goes towards that, you know, being comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? Use open-ended questions to dig deeper. Do not make promises to stakeholders that we will be able to solve their problem just to appease them. Remember, you are not coming up with a solution at this point. You are documenting their needs and wants. Listen to them and take action where you are able to. When have you had to handle negative stakeholders? And what are you going to do differently now that you have these tips? So now that we've covered these things around conflict resolution and these things around negative stakeholders, which can also cause conflict, right? What is it that you look back at the things that you've been involved in, in either conflict situations or when you've had negative stakeholders and you felt like you were just, you know, beating your head against the wall and you didn't know how to get through to them? What do you think you might have been able to do differently if you had had these tips then in order to be able to foster better communication with them? I want you to really put some thought into that. And if you have more questions related to um, either the audience recognition or conflict resolution, then you are more than welcome to contact me. Uh, my contact information is on the screen, but I see there's a typo here. I'm going to fix that right now. My email address is Teresa at theanalystcoach.net. You'll also see the uh, phone number for my company and my website on here as well. And if you have any um, questions about what I've shared here around conflict resolution, um, negative stakeholders, uh, audience recognition, any of these things that we've discussed today, then you are more than welcome to email me or give me a call and I will be glad to discuss your questions with you. 
I hope that you have enjoyed the information that I have shared on this webinar today.